Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the introduction to Open Educational Resources webinar presentation, a collaboration with the Tennessee Higher Education Commission Task Force on Textbook Affordability. I am Nancy King Sanders, Vice Provost for Student Achievement at Austin Peay State University. Joining me as presenters for today's webinar are Elizabeth Spica, a PhD candidate in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where she works as a graduate research assistant in the UT Library's Office of Scholarly Communication and Publishing, and was recently awarded a fellowship by the Open Education Group. Dr. Ryan Corstange, Assistant Professor in the University Studies Department at Middle Tennessee State University, where he coordinates the academic first year and transfer curricula, and Ashley Sergiotis, a digital scholarship librarian and assistant professor at East Tennessee State University, where she co-coordinates ETSU's open and affordable initiatives and manages ETSU's institutional repository. It is commendable that you are attending today's webinar, which will provide three focus areas what are open educational resources? What does an open educational resource textbook look like? And how can I get started with open educational resources? Following the presentations, there will be time for questions and answers. So please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box at any time during the webinar. We'll collect all of the questions on a running document and make sure to answer any ones we can't address during the Q&A. Today's webinar is being recorded and a link to access the recording will be posted on the THEC Textbook Affordability website, the link for which we'll share later in the presentation. We're having this conversation today because Open Educational Resources present a great solution to the problem of high cost textbook and course materials. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, textbook prices have risen by 1,041% between 1997 in 2015. Moreover, textbook prices affect students and create a barrier to student success. Research shows the cost of course materials can present issues for students in terms of their ability to succeed in coursework and make timely progress to graduation. In a survey of over 21,000 students across 40 two and four year public institutions in Florida, only 23% of respondents said financial aid covered all of their textbooks, indicating that these costs are contributing to the rising levels of student debt as well. Similar findings have been reported nationally, including most recently from the US Public Interest Research Group that indicates 65% of students are still avoiding buying their course materials because of cost. During the current pandemic, it is even more crucial for students to be able to afford and have access to course materials at the beginning of their courses. For our higher education students in Tennessee, we know that students are avoiding buying textbooks, taking fewer courses, earning poor grades, and even avoiding certain majors because of the high cost of textbooks. We also know that they are largely funding these purchases with personal savings and student loans. Student Public Interest Research Group study of 2018 reports that nationwide, each year $3 billion of federal student aid goes to pay for textbooks. If textbooks were not expensive enough the first time they're purchased, think about students who use loans to pay for course materials that must repay the original cost of the course materials amount plus interest. At the current loan rate of 6.8%, the $119.18 you see is the average cost per course actually amounts to about $165 when making the minimum payments over time. Five courses is $595.90 or 852 with minimum loan payments. There are many benefits to using open educational resources for students and faculty. On average, students save $116.94 per course where open educational resources are in use over traditionally copyrighted alternatives. According to the impact of open educational resources 
on various student success metrics. A 2018 article by Colvard, Watson and Park in the International Journal of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, OERs improve end of course grades and decrease the D, F and withdrawal letter grade rates for all students, Pell recipient students, part-time students and populations historically underserved by higher education. OERs provide the opportunity for students to review course materials before the term begins, enabling them to make more informed decisions in choosing their courses and the opportunity to prepare for the class. Further, students have the ability to revisit their course materials after the quarter semester is over to refresh their memories or to further study the topics. Open course materials will help them reinforce what they have learned and further develop their level of understanding in the subject area. Faculty are able to fully tailor content to specific learning outcomes. Also, students rated college faculty who use open materials to be kinder, more encouraging and more creative than faculty using a traditional copyrighted textbook, according to research from Vogetech and Grisset 2017. What are open educational resources? I would like to turn the webinar over to Elizabeth Spika. Thank you, Nancy. As Nancy mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Spika and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where my research centers around course material affordability. I'm also an OER research fellow, so I'm excited to share with you today what exactly are open educational resources, what distinguishes them from traditionally copyrighted materials, and how can you recognize OER when you come across it? So by definition, open educational resources are teaching, learning, and research materials, whether written in video form, audio form, in any format, that reside either in the public domain or they're licensed in a manner that allows everyone the opportunity to um, access them and share them and basically to engage in the five R activities that you see here on this slide. And I'll talk more about those in just a second. Creators of open educational resources apply a Creative Commons license to those works, which is the CC symbol that you also see here in this image. Now this is in contrast to the copyright symbol that we're all used to seeing with the C inside of the circle. So Creative Commons licenses basically legally enforce the sharing of the work. I don't know if you were aware, but in the United States and in most other places, copyright is automatic, whether you want it or not. And while some creators want to reserve all of the rights afforded to them by creating materials, which is fine, other creators, such as educators, want to enforce the sharing of those materials. And so this is where Creative Commons licenses come in. So let's dig into this definition a little more closely, starting with the public domain. You're probably familiar already with public domain materials. Basically, anything in the public domain is free of copyright restrictions. And there are two major ways that something enters the public domain. Um, the first one is, is that the work was published before 1924, or as we enter 2021, 1925. And those works can be indicated by the public domain mark. And that's that image up at the top. You won't always see it, but this is the image that's used in uh, museums and archives that are working with older materials, basically to just denote that, yes, this is in the public domain. Another way that something enters the worldwide public domain is when the creator says, I want it there. And that's the symbol that you see at the bottom. You can use the Creative Commons Zero or CC Zero tool to dedicate your work to the public domain. Basically, when you do this, you're saying, hey, I made this, take it, use it however you see fit. You don't even have to give me credit for it. And um, I know as scholars, we're all about giving credit where credit is due, but um, the people are essentially releasing that stipulation when they use this tool. So again, um, one of the biggest misconceptions about open educational resources is that it has to do with something being free. Like, hey, if it's free, then it must be open. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. As you can see here, and as you will see with these Creative Commons licenses, OER has everything to do with how something is licensed and the permissions that are afforded by that license. There are several Creative Commons licenses, but they're all comprised of these four basic elements. 
So I'll give a quick overview of what these symbols mean when you come across them. The first one, the attribution element or CC by is the most open and flexible. This element is part of every single OER license that you come across. And it basically indicates that you give credit to the creator. So creators of OER, no differently than creators of copyrighted material, receive credit and attribution for their work. So when you come across this license, it means, hey, you can revise, reuse, remix, redistribute, um, all of those five Rs just by giving credit to the author. The second one, no derivatives or ND, essentially means the creator says that you have to share the work as it is. Like, yes, you can use it, but you can't revise it. You can't uh, mix things up in the middle of it. You just have to use it as it is. The third symbol, share alike or SA, means that any adaptations that you create based on the material need to be shared with that same license. So if you are taking CC BY material, mixing it in with CC BY SA share alike material, the end license needs to also be share alike. The final symbol, non-commercial or NC, designates places where you can only use the work for non-commercial purposes, which for us as educators, most of our uses are non-commercial um, anyway. So here they are, the six licenses, um, all comprised of those four elements that you just saw. And it all again depends on the rights that that creator wants to reserve for their creations. These Creative Commons licenses, along with the public domain material, are how you can recognize OER when you come across it. So just like copyright is all rights reserved, Creative Commons licenses are some rights reserved depending upon the author's um, inclinations. Now the real magic of OER lies in what my mentor David Wiley coined as the five R's, to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And it's debatable whether some of those licenses that we just saw um, are truly open because they don't necessarily allow all of these five R's, but in general, um, all CC BY material and truly open material allows you to do these five things. So what do I mean? By being able to retain something, that means you can control a copy of that content. You can download it, you can duplicate it, you can store it, and you can manage it as you see fit. When it comes to reusing something, that means you can reuse it in a variety of ways, not just in your classroom, but on websites, in videos, study groups, in publications that you want, as long again as you attribute that source. To revise it is one of the really great benefits of using OER. You can adapt or modify the content as you see fit. And I think a general use case is that in order to personalize your material, to the populations that you're serving. You may want to take out the examples that they're using and insert something that's more relevant for your students. Also, if you want to take out outdated um, examples or case studies, for example, and put in something more um, relevant and current, you have the freedom to do that with OER. As we look over to Remix, another great thing about OER is that you can take content and mix it together to create something new. In terms of redistribution or the fifth R of redistribute, you can share copies of that original content, you can share your revisions, you can share your remixes with whomever you like for as long as you like in whatever manner that you like. And so um, this also feeds into those benefits that Nancy mentioned about pedagogy and Ryan will talk more about this in a minute about how it's affected his class. But there is an entire body of research um, basically dedicated to what's called open enabled pedagogy, which are the teaching and learning practices that using these openly licensed materials enables that prior to o OER, um, we didn't have that luxury with traditionally copyrighted materials. And Ashley's going to talk later also about where you start, but just to put your mind at rest, um, people have been at the OER game now for over two decades. And so thankfully today, there is well-developed, fully developed OER, ancillaries included, for all of your high enrollment course areas and all general education course areas. So basically, it's a good time to get into the OER game because the road has been well paved. To put it in perspective, 
even though we're focusing today on OER and openly licensed materials in the context of education, OER is all around us and the world is increasingly open. Musicians are using Creative Commons licenses to not only gain exposure, but to create new works that incorporate and build upon the work of others. That image in the center of uh, Commander Jean Cernan on the moon in 72, this is one of the many images that the government makes publicly available and that NASA makes available as part of their mission. Um, one uh, perhaps little known fact is that all federal government works are not copyrightable. So they are all freely and openly available to the public. On YouTube, you can find openly licensed materials that you're free to use and build upon. And then institutions like the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Smithsonian, they've all released large bodies of material and, and really high quality images that again, you're free to take and use and build upon. In terms of OER across our state and the efforts that we're really kickstarting and gaining traction with, you'll find, for instance, the physics department at the University of Tennessee. They've been using OER since 2012. Faculty in the math department at Pellissippi State have converted almost their entire lower division math sequence to OER, to accessible OER. And the same thing is happening at Walter State Community College in the Department of Natural Sciences, where almost all of their courses from chemistry to physics, biology, et cetera, have been converted to OER. It's all around us, and we're excited to have you here today and to welcome you into this community. Thanks, I'll hand it back to you, Nancy. Thank you, Elizabeth. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Ryan for his presentation. Hey, y'all. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to talk about for a second is just what a an OER textbook looks like in a class. And so um, this is a little bit delicate, right? Uh, so I'm going to kind of pull back the curtain and talk about how I use OER in a class that I teach and in a program that I coordinate at Mill Tennessee State University. Uh, this is an example of the way OER can be used. So I'm going to talk a lot about a textbook that we selected, uh, but I want to make this about OER and not about the specific textbook that we're using in our class. So I'll try to walk that line. Uh, the other thing that I want to sort of uh, alert you to right at the beginning is uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk around a couple of benefits, but, but there is a cost benefit to students but there's also a pedagogical benefit and I wanna to try to balance both of those. So let's start with the cost benefit uh, because that may be a little bit more clear and it's certainly easier to quantify. Uh, so uh, in 2018 in our course, I teach a university seminar course. Uh, it's, it's kind of geared towards incoming uh, first year students uh, and we try to help them figure out how to be successful in their learning in college. Uh, and so in 2018, we had worked, our team had worked with a major publisher uh, and we had designed a custom edition of a textbook. And so, right, you, if you've done that before, you know how that works. You spend a lot of time rearranging content. It's all copyrighted content. Uh, and at the end of the process, you get a quote on the price and then you decide to uh, use it in your class and students go out and buy the textbook. Uh, the textbook that we designed uh, included some supplemental resources, quizzes, uh, and tests that could be incorporated back into the course. Uh, and so we came in, we were super excited about this direction. We came in to the first day of class and nobody had the textbook. Um, and that was probably a communication error on our part. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to explain that. Nobody had the textbook. That is, wasn't a big problem. There was a two week trial. So we got people signed up for a trial of the textbook. And for two weeks, things worked well. They could find the, the access, they could read the textbook, they could take the quizzes, they could do the homework that was involved in there, uh, whatever. The two week trial ended and a bunch of people still didn't have the textbook, uh, which is no surprise uh, if you've taught class before. Uh, so basically what we ended up having to do was de we devoted a bunch of in-class time to try to troubleshoot and to help students figure out how to access the textbook uh, and get the textbook. And we took that time away from what I would consider to be more educationally significant, right? Students need to certainly understand how to access and purchase textbooks, but those aren't maybe the most high impact things they need to learn to learn in college. So uh, the course in 2018, fall 2018, uh, our textbook cost was someplace between $55 and $90, depending on where the students bought it. 
which resulted in a cost to students if they had all purchased it of someplace just under $80,000, $75,000. That's a lot of money uh, for a resource that came to be a detriment to student learning. Okay, and that's not always the experience with textbooks. That was our experience with a custom textbook. So from there we shifted and we decided we weren't gonna do that again. And we did another, you know, commissioned a committee. We figured out another uh, direction. And what we decided to do was we settled on an OER textbook and I'll show you what that is right now. Uh, but the, or, or in just a second, the advantages to the OER textbook right off the bat, it solves our access problem. Students have it on the first day. Uh, we give them a link. There's no access problems. Uh, if students forget the link, we can give it again. It's not an access code. There's not a restriction in terms of how long they have access to it. Um, so, so there is an advantage right off, uh, right from the beginning. Uh, okay, let me advance the slide. What is happening here? Uh, okay, and good. So what we've done over the next couple of semesters is that we've settled in an OER. Right now we're, ad we're just, we have adopted an OER. We haven't yet adapted it to our course. That's the next phase of what we need to do. But you can see that over the last three semesters that we've used this OER, we've saved students who are taking our course someplace between you know, 88 and $140,000. That's a ton of money. And that money inc uh, really, really affects student success. The other thing that I wanna mention is this sort of, uh, a lot of students are coming to school and they don't exactly understand uh, that textbooks are an additional charge. And so they are surprised by the cost when they get to class. Uh, and that is a challenge uh, that OER serves to facilitate. Nancy talked earlier about the cost uh, and the loan, the cost, the amount of tuition and fees that students are floating with loans. Uh, and, and so certainly textbooks as an unexpected cost, they can be a real barrier for student success especially when textbooks include some kind of uh, published, uh, some kind of graded component. Um, so we made a shift to OER. I'm gonna give you the link of the OER textbook that we used in just a second. Uh, but what I want you to know right on the front end is that there's work involved in switching to OER. If you've worked with a major publisher, uh, you know that they put a lot of support resources towards uh, those faculty and those programs that adapt their courses. So we had some help with instructional design, uh, of figuring out how to incorporate the textbook into our course shell inside our, lear our learning management system. Uh, we had training, uh, the, the textbook publisher would send us a trainer uh, to help us with various training. They would provide food at some of our training events, right? So there was a lot of assistance and we have to overcome that, right? So we put that together. So we had to do all of that stuff, the instructional design, uh, we had to do the training on our own, um, we had to provide food for ourselves, right? Uh, but what I would say is it turns out to be quite a huge advantage because we actually understand now how our course is built and when there are problems, we can address them a lot more directly and a lot more succinctly. Uh, and I think the student experience ends up being a lot more coherent. The other thing that I wanna mention is uh, with these textbooks, OER textbooks often develop a community of practice, people who are adopting and using this books, these books and creating other resources to help other people who are using the books. Uh, so uh, I'll show you some resources uh, in just a couple of slides that we uh, in the community that uses the book that we use have available. So it's not like you're on your own but you are in control in a way, right? Like you, you select and you pick through uh, what it is that you want, uh, want to use and how to incorporate it. And the last part is pedagogy. Uh, there is something cool about teaching from open resources. Uh, it is responsive, uh, I find. Um, it is uh, open. It situates students to information in a really interesting way. It makes them more analytical and less sort of taking the claims of a textbook on their face as if they were the only truth and all the truth that they needed to understand. So uh, here is the textbook that we use. This actually is a slide that we, uh, that I use in my class on the first day, right? Here's our textbook, scan the QR code, you'll have the textbook. Uh, you can do that if you want, or I see that Elizabeth has put the link into the chat. So, uh, you know, feel free to 
peruse this textbook. I'm going to show you a couple of screenshots from the textbook just so you get a sense of what it looks like. If you followed the link, uh, it goes right here. You know, this is like the title page, right? It's, it's, a, it's a book. It's like any other book. It's just not published by a major publisher. It's licensed through a CC uh, Creative Commons license, uh, which you can see down here. Uh, the one thing that I do want to point out is with this book, this book is available to students in a variety of formats. So they can look at it as a PDF, right? Uh, and that's how I would prefer to look at it. That's how I do look at it. They can look at it as HTML. HTML is just a web language. So it has a web page that it goes to. Uh, so, you know, if I don't have a PDF, I can click to the web page. Uh, and maybe many of you are looking at that format right now. Uh, I can also read it in a variety of digital reader formats. What we find is students end up using more than one of these versions uh, for different purposes. Uh, and that is really interesting uh, and, and quite uh, flexible and useful for them. Uh, here's what the table of contents looks like. And, and you know, if you've not seen an OER book, my point is to just let you see that an OER book looks like a book. Uh, all of these sort of things right here are hyperlinks into the chapter. Here's the chapter. So if I follow, if I click on chapter two, right, uh, I would come right here. It looks just like a book. There's text. This book has uh, embedded videos and embedded hyperlinks to other resources. Um, and, and that's common with electronic books. Uh, so we've incorporated it into the course flow. We use uh, D2L or Brightspace as our learning management system. And what we've decided to do as we incorporate it in is we uh, provide direct links to individual chapters. And these go to the HTML versions of these chapters. So if I were to click here as a student, I would go right back to the book, uh, right to the chapter, uh, and I would know exactly what I need to read. Here is uh, sort of a screenshot, and this is not something that I have a link to handy to share with you, but this is a screenshot of some of the supplemental resources that are available in this community. Um, so there are quiz files. You'll notice that there are quiz files. Uh, well, if you could click in there, which you can't, but there are quiz files for Blackboard, for Canvas, for D2L, for all the LMSs. Uh, then there's also Word files of them. These are things that people in the community have created. Uh, there are PowerPoints. People have created PowerPoints for each of the chapters in the book, and these can be incorporated into the book. Uh, there are also audio versions. People in the community have created audio versions um, of the books. It's students reading the book to students. It's really cool. Uh, it's a really unique way of getting an audio book. Uh, and it was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was an audio production class who created it. So from my perspective, I've used OER in my course. Uh, in, in the courses that I teach and in a program that I coordinate for the last, you know, three semesters, uh, what I notice to be really advantageous uh, are a couple of things. So the first is students have immediate access and they have perpetual access to the book. Uh, one of the fringe benefits here is I can pass on this textbook to students who aren't taking my class, who are struggling with concepts that we cover in my class. Right, so OER positions itself really well as a supplemental resource uh, because it's perpetual access and it's free. Uh, the students who use it, uh, the book is great. Uh, and this is about our textbook. There are high quality OER textbooks out there uh, and students like those. The other part that I would mention here is instructional flexibility. Um, so uh, this semester, uh, right, we're teaching during this pandemic, it's weird. Um, so we're still using the same blueprint for college success as our textbook. Uh, but in addition, there was a supplement. There was a book that's called Learning to Learn Online. It was written by a handful of students uh, at a university in, in Canada this summer uh, and published as an OER book. And so one of the things that we were able to do this semester, Elizabeth just shared a link to that in the chat. But one of the things we were able to do this semester is assign uh, this, this more recent OER book about learning to learn online because so many of our students are struggling to figure out how to learn online. Uh, and the reason that I felt okay to do that in part was we weren't asking students to pay $90 for another textbook where I felt like I needed to make sure that they read every chapter and every word of it. So there is a certain flexibility with OER. Uh, there are OER materials that address all kinds of uh, like current issues, and, and those are interesting to incorporate in the class. 
And then the last thing that I want to mention is just uh, some relation to information literacy, right? The five R's that Elizabeth uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, with OER, you can retain, redistribute, revise, reuse, and remix information. Uh, that to me is what I want students to be able to do with information. I want them to use it, right? The stuff that we provide needs to be functional. Uh, it not it not just abstract not just out there. I want it to be authentic and I want them to figure out ways to use it authentically. So from my perspective, OER orients or allows me to sort of help students orient themselves differently to information and, and it allows me to make it a little bit more authentic to them uh, because it's not the last word. It's not intended to be the last word. It's, it's just good information. Um, and I think that is all that I have and it is. So I'll hand it back to Nancy. Thank you, Ryan. And now I'd like to turn it over to Ashley. Thanks, Nancy. Um, as mentioned, I am a librarian at ETSU and my specialty is finding open educational resources and helping faculty publish them. I am just gonna make sure I can control my screen real quick. All right, and so today I'm going to be talking to you about how you can get started with OER now that you know more about it and you've seen an example in the classroom that Ryan just gave. The first step is brainstorm. So you will want to start thinking about what courses you want to incorporate OER in. Once you do that, you'll want to make sure to bring the learning outcomes from those courses when you start to look for OERs. It's very important to know your learning outcomes so that way you can match those with the content of the OERs that you're finding to make sure that they match. The second thing you'll want to think about is what types of materials are you looking for? Are you primarily looking for a textbook? Are you looking to maybe spice up your classroom with some other types of materials like videos or podcasts so that students can have a different way of learning? Those sorts of questions will help you determine where you should look for OERs. And if you don't know and you're just thinking, I want to know what's out there, that's also a great thought and is a way to help you when you're exploring. The last thing that you'll want to consider is your time commitment that will come in later and I'll be talking about different ways you can implement OERs in your courses and they're going to have different time commitments. So knowing what you can realistically do is very important. So the next step is to explore and you can't really move forward with OER until you know what's really out there. Unfortunately, there is not one place you can go to find every single OER available because they're published all over. And so there's lots of different guides out there to help you sort through OERs and go to different sites so that you can find what you're looking for easier. One place I would check out is your institution's websites for OER guides. Um, not every institution may have a guide, but I was able to find guides on different uh, Tennessee institutions pages. Normally they live on the library website, but that's not always the case. And if you're going through this explore phase and you have questions, think about reaching out to your library. Your librarian should be able to help you find these resources. Um, and if they don't um, specialize in that area, they should be able to point you to who on your campus can help. But since, you know, we've come from all over Tennessee, I really didn't want to focus on one single institution's guide. So I wanted to mention the Creative Commons directory. This is a guide for anyone to look at to try to find OERs. They provide a great list of links that you can go to to find OERs, um, general searches, as well as places if you're specifically looking for textbooks or lectures or a specific material type. Right here is the bit.ly link for the guide. Uh, there should also be a link in the chat. And 
if you even Google Creative Commons OER, usually that page will pop up. So if you went to that link, this is what the page will look like. It starts off with general searches. You can find OERs in places that you normally search. For example, Google, uh, Elizabeth also mentioned YouTube. So there's already options for you to search for places you're familiar with, um, specifically narrowing your search to find works with Creative Commons licenses. If you scroll down on the page, you'll notice that there are lots of sites that focus specifically on educational resources. Some I wanna point out is general education searches. These websites are great if you were that person in the brainstorm phase when you were thinking, I just wanna see what's out there. I don't know what I'm looking for. The, these general education searches are probably where you wanna start because they collect OERs from all over different places and they also um, with different material types. One place I wanna point out is OER Commons. That's a great place to start if you're looking for general education searches. If you were someone in that brainstorm phase that was thinking, I really just want textbooks, then they also have a list of sites where you can just look for textbooks or other specific types of material types like videos. If you're looking just for textbooks, I would suggest two sites. One is the Open Textbook Library. These have a great list of customizable uh, high quality textbooks. They also um, have a nice little uh, review area where faculty like yourself have reviewed the textbooks and you can read the pros and cons of the books. There's also this OpenStax. OpenStax publish also high quality textbooks and they have those auxiliary materials that Ryan was talking about that were associated with the textbook that he implemented in his course. Um, they often have PowerPoints, um, assessments, test banks, stuff like that. Um, OpenStax also usually have an option to, for students to print the textbook at a low cost. And OpenStax really focuses on those general education courses. So if you are looking for an OER, specifically an open textbook, in a general education course, I would start off with OpenStax. Now, unfortunately, this is an only an hour webinar, so I don't have time to go through these searches. So I just wanna reiterate that if you get stuck, contact your institution's library and they will be able to help you or point you to who can help you on your campus. Now, once you've done this explore phase and you've got a pretty good idea of what's available for your courses, then you'll wanna start thinking about how you wanna implement these resources into your course. And there's usually three main tracks people talk about when they talk about implementing OERs. There's adopt, adapt, and create. I'm gonna go over each one to give you some examples. Now, let's say during the explore phase, you found a textbook that perfectly fits with your course, then you probably would do an adoption. And that is assigning an OER in your course without any customizations to the resources. It's literally just plugging in an OER into your course. So for example, if I was a music appreciation instructor, I may plug in this understanding music past and present. Now, sometimes maybe a textbook is great, but you want to flesh out course readings. Then you may want to supplement it with other types of OER, like this video from Yale or primary sources um, like the sheet music that's in the public domain. So adoption is not just taking the textbook and plugging it into your course, although it can be. It may be going to a bunch of different places and collecting a bunch of different types of readings and materials for your course. That is particularly true maybe for the upper level courses and graduate level courses in comparison to those general education courses. Now let's say during the explore phase, you found a textbook or a resource that almost fits your course objectives, but not quite. Then you may want to do adaptation. And that is when you customize the OER that you're gonna put into your course. So 
So for example, here I have a textbook that is quantitative research methods and an instructor thought that this didn't really fit the course level um, for his class. Um, it was a little too high level. So he made two versions of the textbook that really was geared towards undergraduates. And he also customized it because the undergraduates were more familiar with Excel than the application R. Um, so these, this is just an example of way you can customize a text to make sure it fits both the learning objectives as well as the course level. And adaptation doesn't just have to be editing a textbook. It may be compiling a bunch of different OERs together to create a new resource. It can be changing format. Uh, so for example, Ryan mentioned that his um, textbook is now an audiobook. I've also seen an instructor take their textbook and make it more into a podcast format. So there's different ways that students can um, understand the textbook and learn from it rather than just reading it. The last is creation. And this would happen if during the explore phase, you don't really find much for your area, which can happen and you decide that you want to take it into your own hands and create an OER to plug into your course. As you can tell, as you go from adoption, adaptation, and creation, more time commitment happens, and that's why I, I mentioned time commitment in the brainstorm phase. Now, creation can mean creating a textbook from scratch, um, and there are communities out there to help you with that, but it can also mean recording your course lectures. Uh, creating um, some lab activities, creating homework assignments. It doesn't have to be as monumental as, you know, creating a 300 page textbook. One big thing I wanted to remind everyone on is that if you do decide to go the adaption and creation route, make sure that you share it widely. Make sure you share it underneath a Creative Commons license, particularly one that has um, allows for derivatives so other people can adapt your adaptions or adapt your creations. That's a big part of OER. And lastly, implementing OER in your courses does not have to be a race to the finish line. Um, some of you may be able to transform your entire course into OER, uh, replace a textbook that's costing students money with a textbook that isn't, and that is fabulous. Um, some of you may not be able to have that, you know, you don't have that time commitment, you didn't find the resources you were looking for. Maybe instead you just plug in a few videos that are underneath a Creative Commons license in your course. You can do this piecemeal, you can do it over several semesters, you don't have to do it all at once. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Nancy. Thank you, Ashley. What are next steps if you want to begin using open educational resources? Well, the first thing to do would be to connect with the Tennessee OER community. And we have a listserv and uh, the address for Dr. Collier is there so that you can join the listserv. Um, you can also visit the Tennessee textbook affordability website and the email address, uh, I'm sorry, the URL is there. And you can also begin by gathering your learning outcomes for the course that you want to teach and connect with your campus OER liaison. And we do have some excellent questions that we're going to address here in a moment. Um, but also, I would like to thank you for attending today, and we have a couple of questions that you'll receive as you exit the webinar. So let me go ahead and um, ask the first question, and if you have additional questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A, and we'll get to those. And uh, the first one, I'll probably... Uh, let one of our panelists select who, you know, they can let me know who they want to answer it, and then I will mute so they can go ahead and answer. What are best practices for implementing an OER text so that students are becoming familiar with the text and utilizing it throughout the course? 
what are best practices for training faculty to fully integrate the OER text into their course. Maybe I can take a stab at this one. Um, so this strikes me as an instructional design question. That's a question that's common, not just to OER, resource, OER textbooks or, or materials, but sort of all materials. And I think that we're at this place instructionally, or at least I'm at this place instructionally where, uh, you know, the, the stereotype of students is that they're not gonna spend the time reading the textbook anyway, right? And so uh, we're broadly trying to figure out what it, what it takes to make students do the reading, right? And so there are a number of responses that would range from, you know, just quiz the heck out of them to uh, using some of those uh, new ed tech services that drop quizzes sort of into the reading. And so they're doing um, assessment as they're doing reading. Uh, but I, from my perspective, the thing that I try to focus on is value. So I try to make sure students know that I've curated the research resources, right? Like I'm not just assigning stuff for the sake of assigning stuff, that there's a value to it. And I try to front that value. Uh, I also try to make sure that they understand the time commitment, excuse me, the time commitment involved in reading it and that they understand some strategies for how to read it. So uh, one of the things that I'm experimenting with this semester is um, using sort of collaborative annotation so students uh, can kind of work through the reading together and try to bring in some of that peer pressure. I use, I'm using a service called Hypothesis, which is interesting. Um, and there's nothing or there's nothing like this specific to Hypothesis. But yeah, that, I think that's a big instructional design question. Um, and maybe other people think differently. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we have another question. I would love to know more about how this type of multi-format book is best created. Just a quick comment that this really ties in closely with um, another question that we had. Um, really, and I think Ryan, you could speak to this because you've had the experience of making this transition. Um, a previous question was also, did you write this book? Um, and how did you bring these materials together? Something that Ashley said that's very important is starting with your learning outcomes. Because if you all remember your days in um, your master's and doctoral programs where you sat down to do your thesis and your dissertation and you just got lost in the world of all of the research that was out there. And then you realize, wow, I've just spent six hours and I've got nothing written down in my paper. Um, I'm experiencing that right now to a certain extent. But it's the same thing with OER. It's important to start with your learning outcomes and be targeted about what you're using and a simple material that just reinforces your learning outcomes, which again, underscores what Ryan said about the ability to pick and choose the material so that you're giving your students exactly what they need to teach them and help them learn what you're there to help them with. Um, Ryan, can you talk about that process for you? Yeah, so for, right, so, uh, the, the one thing that I do want to clarify, right, I, the book that we're using in the class that I teach, it's not a book that I wrote. Uh, it's not that I have anything against writing OER. I just haven't been around long enough to be able to do it yet. Um, and so it's something that's on the horizon for me. I just haven't done it yet. My understanding of the multi-format is that that's something that happens sort of through the process of publishing with one of the OER pub sort of publishing houses. So the, the book that we use is a press books book. And I think that the multi-format is just sort of part of their process. It was one of the things that uh, was really appealing to us when we were selecting the book. Uh, and, and we selected the book in a committee. Um, so it's, it's not just my feeling that the book was good. You know, some of the other faculty who teach in the program with me uh, felt like it was good. There's another question that I want to, that ties into this um, from Bill in the Q&A about uh, the instructor materials and how you find them. Uh, my experience is that I didn't have to find them, they found me. Uh, when I sort of made some inquiries about the book, uh, I reached out, there, there was some, you know, hey, if you're thinking about using this book, here's a link, follow this link. Uh, and as soon as I reached out uh, via that link, uh, the author of the book responded with a bunch of emails about other materials and the community of practice that's developed around there. Uh, so one of the things that I think is interesting about the OER movement broadly is that it's a, it's a broad movement and there's a lot of different processes. So something like OpenStax 
would have a different um, kind of mechanism into those support materials. But uh, my, my sort of, my experience is that those support materials found me more than me having to search for them. Yeah, I can add on a little bit more to that. In terms of OpenStax, you access those ancillaries no differently than you would with the traditional publisher. You write them in and they give you a faculty and instructor login so that you can download um, PowerPoints, supplemental materials and other ancillaries. A great question just came through about quizzes being embedded in the reading. Now that OER has been on the ground running for a couple of decades now, we're moving more so, we're always generating more content, right, in the name of currency and relevance, but we're now also moving more into data science and um, technologies and software that are also openly licensed. One resource we didn't mention is Lumen Learning, L-U-M-E-N learning.com. And you can go there and they have developed a technology that actually allows you to um, allow students to have questions and they get instant responses. And you can link out to those directly from your Canvas course. They're partnering with Carnegie Mellon to increase the uh, relevance of the material and figure out where students are struggling, no different than a traditionally copyrighted publisher is doing. So I'm excited about this next shift. Yes, it is possible. The faculty at Pellissippi, for example, who are using MyOpenMath for their math solution, MyOpenMath has algorithmically generated questions that basically people all across the United States and the world are um, putting into um, a shared bank. So you can draw from those questions, they're algorithmically generated. So there's a lot of exciting things happening now that weren't happening a decade ago. And I also wanted to um, mention in the vein of that is, uh, for example, with OpenStax, Lumen Learning, um, they do list it with the OpenStax. So if you go to an OpenStax textbook, you'll be able to see what uh, instructor resources are available as well as what third party systems are available that work with that OER. Uh, so once again, you don't have to really go and um, search for these additional materials. Usually if they work with the textbook, the textbook will mention it somewhere. And there is an, an additional question. How do you know if a Creative Commons book went through an editorial process versus something self-published that wasn't reviewed, edited, et cetera? That is a good question. And we hit a little bit on that in the chat. Um, depending upon where the resource comes from, for instance, OpenStax, they sponsor, they have a, an entire peer review process, basically. So you know that if it's bubbled up to the top and made it to the OpenStax website, that it has been peer reviewed and undergone the same process just as rigorously as other materials. Other companies do this as well. Sometimes when you go to search, for instance, on Merlot or the Open Textbook Network, there will be reviewer rating systems. So you can see what is maybe more worthy of your time to further explore based on those ratings. Another important thing to mention is that all of us, none of us get to go into the classroom without having our colleagues' eagle eyes on the things that we're doing and using. And so there is a peer review process, even amongst your own institution and the colleagues with whom you're teaching these courses with. And that's, that's also not to be discounted. So um, we, we are reviewers ourselves. In general, the more popular a resource is by default, it has been reviewed more. So there are a few different ways to look at it and uh, maybe others have some additional thoughts. Thank you, Elizabeth. And there is an additional comment. While Pellissippi has a number of sections that use the OER model, and those sections have been developed meticulously, there is no course in the math department that has adopted OER across the board. I see, yes. Thank you, David, for that uh, distinction. Yeah, I referenced uh, faculty in the Pellissippi math department. Um, so not all the way across the board, by no means is their entire math department transformed to use open educational resources. But I spent a lot of time interacting with a lot of very passionate educators across the state. And I have to say that the work that they have done there in math, um, which reflects courses that we are all teaching all across the state, regardless if you're at a two-year community college or a four-year research one institution, that their work is absolutely um, 
spectacular. One of the issues that we come across is being able to share that work. And that's something that the task force and this open education initiative is working on as a next step so that you would know who is using OER where. And that's something that we're working toward over this next year and are excited to share with everyone. There's a question in the chat, in the Q&A about um, accessibility. And I think it dovetails in some ways uh, with the question about peer review that we've been talking around or editorial review. And so the, the, my perspective on both of these questions is, well, I guess maybe I'll start with accessibility, right? Accessibility is a question that is a question for everything we're using in our classes. OER is no exception. Um, but there are accessibility concerns about a lot of resources. And so that's a broader concern uh, that includes OER and maybe not a specific concern to OER. Um, the, but the other thing that I wanna mention, and this, gets, this combines uh, accessibility with the, the notion of review and editorial kind of work around OER. OER is a pretty diverse and broad movement, right? So different OER will kind of, follow or fall into different standards. And so I think the burden is on the, the people who are selecting OER to make sure that it fall, like coheres with accessibility standards, but then also that it falls through whatever process of review or edit, editing that you're comfortable with. I think that that's also the case for any other material that I'm bringing into the classroom, right? Like I don't wanna bring stuff in that's bad. So I'm reviewing it all the time. I, I'm not, I'm not willing to rely on a whole lot of third party places to make those decisions for me. And uh, thank you, Ryan. Alice Wershing has a question. How are OER resources being reviewed for accessibility? I believe we, we've already covered that. And I don't see any other questions at this point. Again, we appreciate you attending. And as a reminder, try to join the textbook affordability listserv. Um, please check out the Open Educational Initiative website because that's where the webinar will be posted. We also have some testimonial type videos that faculty who are using OERs across the state have created from faculty to faculty. And the contact information for the panelists is on the slide. So you're welcome to contact us with further questions. And we will also follow up if there are any additional questions in the chat or in the Q&A that we haven't answered. Thank you so much.